Showing y'all. So when you see these bomb threats uh, at HBCU universities in 2022, there's nothing new under the sun. And what you all think is beauty today, you understand, is not beauty in the sight of God. It's not beauty in the kingdom. We're gonna bring back the real beauty. When you do stuff like that, by the way. That means you hate that you hate your kids. Yeah, there it is, right there. You you actually hate your kids. One of the villains of Maccabees was a man named Sauron. You go in the Lord of the Rings, his name was Sauron. What you ought to understand, like right now, a roach could walk inside this room, and that roach is a freaking um, spy, man. Brothers with deep words, Kofi. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, they got eight different children, but six different women. Mm -hmm. So everybody wants to know the secret recipe of what we're doing here at IUIC. Christ is King. I'm going to show you and prove to you that the Israelites are black, were always black, always will be black. Thank you, Nathaniel. Yeah, he a prophet said back to the earth. He sent you to wake up the people and tell them come out of the church, come out of the church. Be ready for war, as soon as they run, get out of the dirt, out of the dirt. Hey. Shout out, what? Shout out, what? Shout out, what? Tools down. Shout out, what? Shout out, what? Shout out, what? Tools down. Got the juice, I ain't talking no blue late. Cause he's walking in light of a new day. I can't listen to nothing a few say. Thank the Lord that he showed us a new way. Shout out, what? Shout out, what? Shout out, what? Tools down. Shout out, what? Shout out, what? Shout out, what? of Ukraine and seek refuge in neighboring countries, we are getting reports of Africans being discriminated against at the border. Maybe you've seen the images uh, by now. They're all over social media under the hashtag Africans in Ukraine. Even civil rights lawyer Ben Crump tweeting the video out. Reportedly, it shows black and brown people not being allowed to board trains and buses to flee the war zone, being pushed back. Um, and it is, or at least appears to be, because of the color of their skin. Uh, right now, we're working to verify the video here at BNC and the source of it. Meantime, Nigeria's foreign affairs minister tweeted, quote, I am personally coordinating with our missions in Ukraine, Poland, Russia, Romania, and Hungary to ensure we get our citizens out of Ukraine and bring them back to Nigeria, those ready to return while supporting those who are remaining in Ukraine. So very serious situation there. Um, I, we were surprised perhaps not, you know, knowing, don't know what you don't know, that there were a number of black people in Ukraine. I speak for, I think, mm. both of us. Neither one of us is surprised that all around the globe, mm. no matter the circumstance, that um, racism exists and persist and amidst all this black evil christians are praying for racist ukraine look at this they are praying for people that despise black people's guts praying to a white god a white jesus for a racist regime and meanwhile back at the ranch the united states of america has been bombing somalia at the same damn Time. You can't make this up, brothers and sisters. We got to leave the black evil Christian church today. No! We are not allowing any black people to enter inside the gates. We are all here. It's only Ukrainians that they are allowing in. Even the ones with kids, they're not allowing them in. They really have been here for days and nobody's asking any questions. Only Ukrainian 
woman can kill their life into this gate. All the place is blocked and all are full of blood. From different communities, from different countries, nobody is talking to us. Now y'all see the hell that our people are catching in the Ukraine. The Ukraine. They won't even let black people leave. They put white people ahead of black people. But the black Christian church, that evil institution, keep, wants us to pray to a white Jesus, pray for Ukraine, and these people despise our guts. Y'all remember Psalm 44? Let me just get to the point uh, that I want to get. Psalm 44 and verse 13, thou makest us a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to them that are round about us. Thou makest us a byword among the heathen. You know what a byword is? Like when they call us nigger, coon, wetback, spick. These are bywords. African-American bywords. Thou makest us a byword among the heathen, a shaking of the head among the people. My confusion is continually before me. And the shame of my face has covered me. Why are we confused? Because in the Christian church, they keep lying to us, telling us to pray for these white people, pray to a white God, pray to a white Jesus, and everybody hates our guts. We better leave the Christian church today, brothers and sisters. Leave that evil, filthy institution. And notice ain't none of them speaking on, on this topic. Notice these black, evil Christians are not speaking on the evil done to our people in the Ukraine. Shalom, brothers, shalom, sisters, Bishop Nathaniel here. You know what day it is. That's right. It is Shout Out Tuesday. It's Shout Out Tuesday. And you know how I love to read your letters of uh, exhortation and your donations of support. But before I do that, I often love to cover a little bit of history. So today I'm going to show you the history and I'm going to discuss Dr. Eric Mason. He is part of the urban apologist Christian group, you can say. Um, the only reason I'm bringing them up because they discussed the Israelites. If it wasn't for that, I would never even discuss this guy or the group because the urban apologists, they got the white apologetics apologists separated from them. So the black ones were forced to call themselves urban apologists, which is just stupid stupidity the whole group of them but anyway anyway let's take a look into our history a treatise on physical geography comprising hydrology geognosy geology meteorology botany zoology and anthropology by a barrington this was first published in the year 18 50. 1850. I always tell you, get the old books, the old books. While we were still in slavery, let's see what these scholars have put together regarding the Israelites. All right. Thus the Jews are people who have ever, according to the prophecy, dwelt alone without intermixing with the nations to this day. Now this separate race all descended from brown ancestors. For Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob must have been as dark as Maria Hanan, if not darker. Exhibit every shade of color from the black Jews of Malabar, of whom we have such an interesting account by Claudius Buchanan, to the rose lily complexion of the Jewess on the banks of Elbe, thus Amalek. Those are converts. We need go no further than the Jews of southern Spain and compare them with those of Holland and northern Germany to perceive a very striking difference. Because remember, you had uh, original black Jews and then you had white Jews, which were converts. The Spanish Jew is always dark complexioned and his hair is uniformly black. Whilst the German Jew, this convert, is often as fair as any German in his light or red hair with blue eyes. These are converts, these are Edomite, Edomites. The various shades of color observable among the Negro or African race tends to the same conclusion. Along the coast of Guinea, which is low, marshy, and hot, we find jet black complexions, and this is the very country from which American Negroes have been derived. 
So these American Negroes, they know are Jews. These are Israelites descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Fact. Light and truth collected from the Bible and ancient and modern history containing the universal history of the colored and, and the Indian race. This was published in 1844. 1844. All right, on page 249, page 249. The Hebrews are called after Heber, pronounced Eber, their great father, from whom all the Hebrews descended. The Israelites are called after the great father Israel. Remember, Israel, whose name was Jacob, descended from Eber. The Jews are descendants from Judah. That's where the word Jew comes from. Jew is short for Judah. It's an abbreviation. The Jews are descendants from Judah, their great father, and are called after him in Africa and Asia. You see, did you see that? The Jews are descended from Judah, their great father, and are called after him in Africa. Showing you the real Jews are black. Page 348. The prophet Noah. Noah, the son of Lamech, was a prophet of the anti-diluvian world. A knowledge of the diluge, of the deluge, was made known to him about 120 years before the flood. He was a just man and a faithful preacher of righteousness. He warned the people of their destruction by a flood. God commanded Noah to build the ark or great ship and Ham, a mighty man, helped to build the ark at God's command. The posterity of Noah who inhabited the earth after the flood were a colored people and their language was Hebrew. See the historical books of the ancients. This language was originally given to man by his creator and afterwards broken into a multitude of tongues at Babel. The Hebrew, it is almost certain, was the language of Adam and Eve and it is certain their complexion was black. Solomon, the song of Solomon, the wise man, the words of Solomon, the son of David to his friends, I am black, but comely, graceful. O ye daughters of Jerusalem, look not upon me because I am black as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. Here Solomon describes his color to be as beautiful as the tents of Kedar, whose tents were made of black goat's hair. Wow. Isaiah the prophet of Amos. But they obeyed not the word of the Lord by the mouth of the prophet, and were led away, young and old, naked and barefoot, into captivity. Isaiah 20. As they were black, so was he. He who? He was Isaiah. As he was naked, so were they led naked and barefoot, young and old, into captivity. Even to this day, from Africa, their descendants are led away by a wicked people into slavery. Wow. A brief history of the Wesleyan missions on the western coast of Africa. This was published in 1851. You can see it right there, 1851. Thus they are fair, referring to the Jews. Thus they are fair in Britain and Germany, 
Brown in France and in Turkey. Swarthy, swarthy means black in Portugal and in Spain. Olive in Syria and in Chaldees. Tawny, tawny means black or copper colored in Arabia, in Egypt, and nearly black in Abyssinia. And yet they are all Jews of one common ancestry, nation and language, though scattered o'er all the earth they lie. I want to look up this word. Um, where was Swarthy at? Mm. We want to look up Swarthy. And in the same definition, you're going to also see Tawny, this word here. Tawny and Swarthy are synonyms. And the old definition is black. Watch this. Swarthy, etymology, alteration of swarthy from swart plus y, from Old English swart, meaning black. Let's go down to the adjectives for swarthy. Number one meaning, tawny, dusk, dark. No, tawny, dusky, dark. Number two is dark-skinned. Let's jump down to the synonyms. Look at the synonyms. Dark-skinned, black, dusky, sable, sooty. Tawny, see tawny, dusky, dark, dark-skinned. Being an accurate description of the regions of Egypt, Barbary, Libya, and Bill Delgarid, the land of Negroes, Guinea, Ethiopia, and the Abyssinians. That's Ethiopia. Published in 1670. 1670. Let's go in. All right. I'm on page 34. That's the original page, but in this book, it's on 31. All right. I'm going to start here. Many Jews also are scattered over this region. Some natives boasting themselves of Abraham's seed. It's talking about Africa. Let's see the title there, Africa. Many Jews also are scattered over this region. What region? Africa. Some natives boasting themselves of Abraham's seed, inhabiting both, si inhabiting both sides the river Niger, or Niger. Others, uh, others are Asian strangers who fled thither either from the desolation of Jerusalem by Vespasian at 70 AD or from Judea, wasted and depopulated by the Romans, Persians, Saracens, that's Muslims, and Christians, or else such as came out of Europe, whence they were banished. So it's referring to those Jews, those black Jews that were banished those Jews that were keeping the commandments that were banished. Not all the all the blacks, but the ones keeping the commandments. Out of some, they were banished where from where? Out of some parts of Italy in the year 1342. Out of Spain in the year 1462. Out of the Low Countries, that's the Netherlands, in 1350. Out of France in 1403. Out of England in 1422. These all defer in habit and are divided into several tribes, having no dominion, though both wealthy and numerous, but despised of all nations, and so abominated by the Turks that they are not admitted to be Mohammedans unless first baptized, and then, other, and then no otherwise made use of than to receive their customs and gather in their taxes. The image of the black in Western art. This is a sculpture of um, St. Maurice. We went over this several times. Uh, also remember that this is edited by David Byman, who is a, 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 a 
I believe he's a racist. Then you got Henry Louis Gates Jr. who's obviously asleep while this guy is writing. Okay, he must have got, he must, Henry Louis Gates must get paid to close his eyes to not see the evil and ignorance that this guy puts together. All right, let's go into the book. All right, I want you to take a look at this. I want to focus today on um, plaque or plate number 18, decorated initial, florist, expositio in epistolas poli, volume two, uh, following 67 V, Carby Abbey, 1164 in Paris, Bibliothèque Nationale, that's the library, National Library, National Library, year is 1164. Now this, I'm assuming it says Exposito in Epistolas Poli. Seems like it's Epistle of Paul, number 18. But let's go inside, let's go to the next page, because that's how these quote unquote scholars do things and when they hide things from us. Watch this, all right. Is number 18, but it starts over here. All right. Given the present state of our knowledge, it is very hard to find a place in this study for a series of decorated initials. Decorated initials, we're gonna focus here, decorated initials dating from the 12th century, that's 1164, I just showed you, in which the figures of partially or totally nude men with more or less clearly marked black characteristics form the stem of the capital letter P. So there's a black man who's gonna be in a design of the capital letter P, okay. These initials appear in a group of manuscripts executed in Northern France, and they include one common trait. They are all connected with St. Paul's epistles. So let's take a look at this letter of St. Paul in 11, the year 1164. Bam. So here's the P. I want you to see. Here's the circle. And here's the stem. I'm, let me pull back. Let me pull back so y'all can see it. This is a P. Zoop. P. A. U L U S. Paulus. Paul. Why does Paul's letter have a black man? with a sword going through the head of a demon Caucasian. Remember in Hebrews 4, it says the word of God is quicker than a two-edged sword. So Paul has himself in this design, a black man with a sword. Here's the legs, here's the feet. I want y'all to see this and look at it good. So Paul's letters shows him as a black man, like in Acts 21, 26, where they thought Paul was an Egyptian. He said, no, verily I'm a man of Tarsus, a Jew. Now let's go back to the writings again. Okay, now I'm going to the next section, number 22. One of the most Negroid in appearance, if only because of the hair done in tight curls, is in Corby manuscript. More exotic, is the figure wearing an odd looking short garment seen in a manuscript of the New Testament, now in Berg and Bresse. Unfortunately, its province is not known. The reason for the appearance of this type in Northern France is still not clear to us. They never want to admit the Jews are black and we lived in France. This guy, David Byman is a demon. So here's the other letter is a P, a Negroid man, but this is more blue in complexion, blue in color, 
with this little outfit on, but he's a black man. And there's a serpent, he's fighting. The serpent got his head, mouth on his head. All right, remember, what, what, this is number 22. Decorated initial introducing St. Paul's epistle to the Colossians. You see that? Decorated initial introducing St. Let me, let me zoom in a little closer. Decorated initial introducing St. Paul's epistle to the Colossians. New Testament. Y'all see that? And Saltafa uh, following 91V, second half of the 12th century. That's around 1164. So here's another one, St. Paul. This is more blue in complexion, but he's fighting a serpent, a snake. Now you notice here, they tell you straight, St. Paul's epistle, right? To the Colossians. Notice what, what did you forget the other one? We went, when we went to this one, uh, number plate number 18, it's not in English too much. Decorated initial, florist, expositio in epistolas poli. So if, if you didn't have a clue to know that this is epistle Paul, but they don't want to make it too plain. Why? Because here is clear that Paul Paul is described or shown as a black man with a sword. Do y'all see that? Do you Christians see that? All right, you sword for yourself. And I hope you glean something from today's look into history. All right. Um, what I'm going to do now is take a look at Dr. Eric Mason of the urban or nigger or nigger nigga, I know it's a nigger apologist that's what it should be urban urban is just a a new or or or, or fantismo name <laughs> am i making words up for ur, for for nigger urban apologist nigger apologist, it's the same thing white folks didn't want you with them so then you get the hell out so now white black people say oh let's call ourselves the urban apologist <laughs> Anyway, he goes into, you know what a lot of Christians do? They interview uh, black Christians about the Israelites rather than sit down and discuss the Israelites with Israelites. They discuss it with Christians looking from the outside in. It's, there's this, this is, they're the dumbest and most evil group ever. Anyway, let's take a look at, um, Dr. Eric Mason, and I forgot the young lady's name that's interviewing him, but she's also an urban apologist. They both went to cemetery school, I mean seminary school. Uh, they learned from their slave masters, so they're very, quote-unquote, educated in oppression. Let's take a look, and I'll be right back with my commentary. Um, when I was still in seminary, uh, one of my friends came to me because her friend started dating the guy that had gotten um, swept up in Hebrew Israelism. Notice she said she went to cemetery school and she used an odd word called Hebrew Israelism. Hebrew Israelism is a term made up by Edomites. And <laughs> I'm trying not to be insulting. Negroes follow whatever white folks create. And he, mm -hmm. they were faithful members at their church. And then he got plugged in to one of the Hebrew Israelites group in Richmond, Virginia, and mm -hmm. started absorbing their stuff. And so he took the questions he had for his pastor from the group and his pastor was like, um, let me get back to you. And so I don't know if he didn't know the answers or he just didn't have time, but he ended up going into Hebrew Israelism because he felt like his pastor didn't have enough answers or didn't give him yeah. any answers. So he was like, well, if you can't give me any answers, this group has answered. The Hebrew Israelites, although they are wrong, uh, unfortunately, many of us cannot counter what they're teaching, number one, because we Yo, do, you, do you think pastors are starting to see the need to 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 take that apologetic um, um, approach in the, in their preaching or just even understanding why it's important? Yeah, it's it's happened. It's by the thousands. Um, there are several churches in America 
that have had mass conversions um, to Hebrew Israelism. Now, let me say this because I want to be fair to Hebrew Israelites. Um, all of them aren't the same. You have the camps and then you have what some would have called the moderates, the messianics. And so, I, I, you know, in a way, I don't I don't necessarily argue with them about the whole ethnic thing unless they I, I really spend more time in because anybody can say they ethnically whatever they want to. Really? So can you ethnic ethnically say that you're Chinese? Can you ethnically say that you're Filipino or Korean? Look at the brother. Look at him. You cannot ethnically say you're whatever you want to. I don't really have a problem with that. Um, but usually, nine times out of ten, though, with Hebrew Israelites, it always leads to theological deception. Um, uh, I haven't met, I've only met maybe one or two Hebrew Israelites that, that still hold to orthodox biblical truth, historic biblical truth, but believe they're Israel. Maybe I'll say one, to be honest. Um, but to answer your question, uh, you know, I can't tell you, it's hundreds of pastors. I've had so many white pastors too, white pastors too that are basically sent, trying to figure this thing out. And it has become, I mean, I would say out of all of the, I call them bricks in the book, black religious ideologically ideology cults. <laughs> black religious ideological cults. One thing I want y'all to notice about the Negro, he never calls his slave masters religions cults. The same religions like Christianity, Protestantism, um, Catholicism, they raped his ancestors, raped his mama, raped his grandmama, raped his daughters, destroyed his sons, brothers, and fathers. Yet he will never call them cults. But when the Israelites stand up for him with the word of God, he mocks us and calls us cults. This, this is why you got to beware these Uncle Ruckus, uh, Snow, what's that dude in Django name? Uh, Snow Top Negroes. Beware of them. They are danger, a detriment to our people. Bricks. <laughs> so B R I C apostrophe S, because I get tired of saying that whole thing out. So, uh, um, <laughs> but um, I can't, I, I mean, Lisa, I can't tell you how, I mean, it, it is, it is, it is so pervasive. And I would say the Hebrew Israelite movement is the fastest growing brick movement um, in the world. It's in Africa now. I have people hit me from Zambia, South Africa. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, 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 the, the UK. And the, in the, in the, in the East, this is, their sim this is their simple slide in that they have above, you know, whether you're talking about comedic folk, whether you're talking about gods and earth. See, if you look at Nation of Islam, their cosmology is horrible. Like, I mean, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm saying that respectively. Mm -hmm. Like, their cosmology of the way the world came together is just mythological. I mean, it just doesn't even make sense. Mm -hmm. um, com comedic's the same way. It's more mystical, according to who you talk to, because they're comedic science people and they're comedic philosophy people. So those are two different groups of people, even though they have some overlap. But mm -hmm. with the difference with Hebrew Israelites is they don't make you leave the Bible. Mm -hmm. You see, so they, they automatically got common ground with you because that's why Farrakhan, when he comes in Christian context, cannot use Nation of Islam language. He knows that he has to use Christian language, but put it in allegory and metaphor of not of, for what he really means by it, but using it in a way that doesn't seem offensive to you. I have said that we, the black people of America, are the real children of Israel, of your scriptures. And I have explained the meaning of this to no challenge. Because he knows that, and this, uh, Elijah Muhammad always knew this, the best way that everybody does evangelism in the church. That's, that's, they don't realize that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Everybody is evangelizing Christians. And... And, and 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 when you look, I mean, everybody they they go after. They love going after Christians. I I, I won't say the pastor's name, but there was a group in, in in one of the largest black cities in America, and and it was this group. I forgot which group they were called, but um, that uh, and they were out there talking to these young ladies, uh, beautiful young ladies, and you know they were kind of flirting with them, but they were also teaching them 
if you will. And he gave her like 10 scriptures. He said to her, he said, have you, he said, what church you go to? And he said, the church, I'm like, oh God. And um, he said, on a Sunday, and on a Sunday, he said, you go every Sunday? Yeah. She said, he said, I have I given you more scriptures in our standing here than your pastor does in an hour on Sunday? She said, absolutely. Wow. So, so, I mean, even though the amount of scriptures you give doesn't matter if you're not explaining them right. But, mm -hmm. the, but the issue is that type of straw man energy is what people are getting given. And so pastors really have to return to incarnational ministry. You gotta understand what's going on in your community. You have to be in touch with your young adults. You have to, yeah, listen, if you're not watching The Breakfast Club, you, you as a pastor, let me just tell you something. If you're not watching The Breakfast Club, you don't know what's going on with your people. You understand what I'm saying? You're not watching Hot 97. You, you, you got to watch Hot 97. Um, you got to. You got Hate to disappoint you, my man, but I don't watch Hot 97 and I don't watch The Breakfast Club, but I do study the scriptures. So I know with the spirit of the Lord how to reach the people. I'm going to be following some of your young adults on Instagram. I said, look, bro. I said, you gotta, you got I said, why are you not on social media, man? I'm not da, da, da. I said, man, it's impossible to pastor people now practically without knowing what they're posting and what they like. And mm -hmm. I mean, you have to know what's pastoring your people so that you can pastor your people. Mm -hmm. So yeah. That's so true. Yeah. And that's 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 so big. And I love how you mentioned the they asked her like how many scriptures did did, <laughs> did your pastor use on Sunday? Because I often tell people people study how you preach. So if you mm -hmm. preach topically, they're gonna go home and go over the topic, but they never get to the necessarily understanding how to navigate the text. And so right. you have to like almost do, I know not limited to expository preaching, but almost make that a part of your preaching diet because you'll be like that that quote from um, Bill Lang I like from his Hebrews book that we claim to be people of the book, but in actual practice, we're only people basically of our favorite passages that we keep uh, over and over again. And so yes, <laughs> I think that's where most Christians are. They just don't know, like it's, it's, it's hurtful to me to meet people that have been Christians for 20 years that don't know how to study the Bible to be in their forties and fifties and don't know like how to use the commentary um, and, and concordance and cross-reference. Um, and, and so it's a, the, the, the very, the most important thing is how to understand the Bible um, because that's so where so many people are, which speaks to what you were saying, like not the pastor's not preaching through the text. Um, which yeah. I mean, you've been consistent as long as I've been following your ministry as of going through the text line by line, which I think helps people be more, more disciplined, even in, and know how to study. Mm, praise God. Praise God. So, mm -hmm. um, let's, uh, get to, to the, the next question, which people love to, to understand, uh, know, uh, how to engage Hebrew Israelites. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, because it's, they're, they're an interesting group to engage. I remember when we were at Southern for our HBCU, HBCU uh, tour stop and a, a, a two Hebrew Israelites drove from South Carolina to Louisiana to, just to to cause havoc at the at the event. And mm -hmm. one was more uh, problematic than the other. But when the other one got mad, I think it was something that Dr. Bantu said that he couldn't respond to. So he got he kind of walked out. All right. Number one, the Israelites are not a group. It's the rebuilding of a nation. That's what it's about. We're gathering the elect. Number two, if two people drove from South Carolina in a car just to get to you guys, I can tell you that's not Israel United in Christ. That's not us. And if one of them got overly emotional and angry and couldn't answer a question, a question and stormed out. That's definitely not, not us. I can tell you who it probably is. It probably is these YouTube Israelites who don't want any form of guidance, structure, or leadership. No form of discipline. That's who you encountered. These YouTube, I learned from YouTube, and I can do what you can do, and I can do it better, and then they get mad, overly emotional, and storm out. That's them. The other one stayed, and he got really emotional. And he went from like really hostile to really emotional. 
and he was like, tell me why um, people like me are getting gunned down in the street. And he almost had tears in his eyes. It was like during mm-hmm. the Q&A, the whole crowd. And that mm-hmm. was the first time I was like, okay, this is not this, that like it became, I saw them in a different light. Um, yeah. Or because I was so used to them being hostile. And then it's just like, man, these are 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 guys and 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 women that are really deeply trying to wrestle in some cases with the problem of evil and why mm-hmm. um they're they're seeing so much violence to people that look like them. Remember what she said now. Don't lose the thought. The guy said, why do people that look like me get shot down in the street? Answer the question. Why do black people get shot down in the streets? That's the question. So yeah. how, how do you engage Hebrew Israelites and, and get, advise others to engage with them as well? Yeah. So one of the things that I highly recommend. Don't forget. Why do people that look like you and me, black people get shot down in the streets? Let's see how eloquent he answers the question or does he dance around it? Yeah. How, how do you engage Hebrew Israelites and, and get, advise others to engage with them as well? Yeah. So one of the things that I highly recommend is is it's not helpful necessarily to if we're talking about the camp Israelites in particular to work with them when they're in their pack. And what I mean by that is a lot of times, I mean, it can be helpful, but not necessarily the best way. I think it's one on and it's group environments where we're not trying to put something on YouTube or something. It's more effective. That's why I found it's more effective. Another thing is know the fundamentals of the faith. The average Christian has to, this is the challenge, and this is where our disciple making comes in, Lisa, um, is, is we really have to make, you know, we got to develop the fundamentals. You know, Michael Jordan said one time, uh, <laughs> he said, he said, man, if you if you master the fundamentals, you, you will you will beat out most of the people in the NBA because mm-hmm. most people don't master the fundamentals. And you know, Hebrews chapter six talks about uh, actually chapter five talking about them having to learn the fundamentals again uh, so that they can be able to teach others. And so, a lot of times when you're asked a question about you know, the, you know, he has he has given his statutes under Israel, and and basically when they read that Psalm passage and talking about he's given his Statue on the Israel. He's only Jesus only going to the the the, uh, the uh, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the question is, how do you answer that question? If you have a biblical theology of the people of God that's bigger than understand Israel was one of the groups of the people of God. The largest the largest segment of Scripture is dedicated to that. But you being able to answer the question, no, God from the beginning wanted all people globally to represent them. That's why you see that in Genesis 3. You see it in, you know I mean, Genesis 2, I mean, Genesis 1. You see that in uh, 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 um, uh, Genesis chapter 10. You see that in Genesis chapter 12. You see the, the Israel's purpose is in, Matt, you know, Exodus uh, 19, 6. And you go all the way to Revelation 7. You know, you go all the way to Revelation 19. And so you begin saying, man, let's do the meta narrative. What's the meta narrative of God? That's a covenant that you're like Israel's purpose wasn't to just minister to Israel and then have these levels of the people of God within the framework of the great congregation. But everybody he said the last will be first and first will be last. And so, it, I mean, it's, it's so even if you're talking about that, if you're talking about the use of the law, a lot of times that's why I have a section in here in, in the book on Hebrew Israelites. I mean, in the, in the uh, chapter on Hebrew Israelites about the the use of um, the use of the law, because a lot of Christians. A lot of us, you know, we, we've been taught kind of in Sunday school class, you know, that the Old Testament was law and the New Testament was grace. Well, there's grace. When you've done a segment on this, I believe there's there's grace in the Old Testament and there's 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 wrath in the New Testament. You know what I'm saying? I mean, mm-hmm. you see wrath with Ananias and Sapphira, but you see grace when David should have. He had three counts of death on his life uh, because of what he did. But God forgave his sin. And so a lot of times we don't know the relationship between the law and the fact that there's 613 laws of Moses, but there's 10 hundred and there's 1,050 uh, uh, um, laws of Christ. And how do they relate? The, the law continuity, discontinuity. I can go on and on and on. The whole Sabbath controversy, you know, the eating, you know, eating fringes. Like if you understand kind of like the fundamentals of Christianity, um, there are ways in which when you ask questions, 
the Holy Spirit will guide your mind. That's why he leads you in the truth. He will kind of guide your mind in some things and help you to put together, oh, no, that's you're not seeing the scripture properly. You know, even them using Isaiah passage, you know, uh, what, what, what uh, the passage about, uh, and we misuse that passage. That's a passage on judgment, you know, precept, uh, line upon line, precept upon precept. That that's not a that's not a lesson on hermeneutics. That's actually a judgment uh, for uh, uh, the nation of Ephraim. Ephraim, and so I can go on and on and on. But the, the um, you know, starting with engaging Hebrew Israelites first off is not starting with what they believe versus what you believe. It's learning what you believe over time, and so that you can be able to have a broader view of the Christian faith. Because a lot of people, and this is not just for engaging Hebrew Israelites, a lot of people. Uh, 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 study the faith through apologetics versus doing apologetics from their faith. And when mm -hmm. I say from their faith, I'm talking about from the from the truth of being a disciple in the faith. And your apologetics flows from. That. Many people are they don't they don't do well at defending their faith because playing. It's like it's like this. I'll give you an example. So when I started seminary, um, and I was taking Greek, Greek was extremely hard, and it was harder than it needed to be, because um, I didn't know the English language. And so the way they talked about the multiplicity of past tense, errors, pluperfect, all those different things, I didn't know mm -hmm. what in the world to do because I had to, in order to do Greek class well, I had to go back to English grammar school and really understand the English language so that I can either understand how to translate. By the time I got to Hebrew, I had a better mastery of the English language and Hebrew was actually easier for me than Greek, not because the languages are easier than one another, but because... Um, but because I knew the uh, knew the fundamentals of l l my personal linguistic language better so that mm -hmm. I can access other languages better. It's the same way with learning the faith. And so that, that's, that's one thing I would say that's a huge piece of engaging Hebrew Israelites. Another thing with engaging Hebrew Israelites is keeping them on topic. Mm -hmm. it, it, like that's one of the <laughs> yeah, that's that's like like keeping them. No, 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 no. Let's we'll go to that, but let's go back to this. Let's don't run to that passage. Let's stay in this passage and let's work in this passage. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That is. I mean, you could be here, there, and everywhere with them for hours <laughs> if you don't keep them. <laughs> keep keep them. keep the Israelites on topic. Did this brother ever come with a biblical answer as to why black people get shot down in the streets? No, he didn't. Yourself. Ha, fact, you did take a few steps back to go. You ain't got the answers, brother. man. You ain't yeah. got the answers. I, you, you ain't get, got you, the if, answers. If you, if, you, you ain't but, got the answers, Sway. Kanye. This is the problem with you, you Christians, whether you call yourselves Protestants, Catholics, Apologetics, Baptists, uh, uh, Episcopalians. Pentecostal, don't matter. Whatever denomination you got, you all learn from your slave master. That's where cemetery schools. And you come back with your hermeneutics and your dubidubics and your pluralism and your studies of the Hebrew and the Greek and your commentaries and your cross reference. But you never come to the solutions of why our people suffer and how can we get out of this captivity. You cannot go precept upon precept, line upon line. You can't do it. The spirit of the Lord is not working with you. All right. And this is just more evidence. I want you all to think about this. When our brothers and sisters are shot down in the street or there's some calamity, we're the Israelites. We're right there at the scene, whether that day or the day after, coming with biblical solutions. Where are these Christians like this guy and this woman? Where are they at? Hiding at home behind their keyboards, trying to eisegesis this and exegesis that. Shut the hell up! You don't know the Bible! All right, let's get into the commentary regarding the Jew 3 Project starring Eric Mason, Dr. Eric Mason. Don't let me forget that term, doctor. Lord forbid I forget that term. Now, like I said, I wouldn't have even done this on them because the apologetics, they're a relatively small, uh, relatively unknown group. They really have no impact in the black community or white community for that matter. But because they discuss the Israelites and only for that reason will I even discuss them. All right. So. Let's start off by saying that the apologetics or the apologists are not 
biblical defenders of the gospel, because I believe that's what the term apologetics means, that they defend the good news. They are, however, defenders of white supremacy. In whatever, whatever shape, form, or fashion, apologetics is the name of Caucasian Christians. Remember this, that they, the Caucasian Christians who call themselves apologetics kick the black ones out. They separate and want nothing to do with them. So the black ones form their own apologetic denomination, and whites call them, or Edomites call them, Urban apologists. So that name stuck. Urban apologists. In other words, nigger apologists. That's what it means. <laughs> they always reference what they call the church fathers, whether Catholics, Protestants, Reformists, Calvinists. And there's a long list of what they call the church fathers. And I've showed y'all in lessons before how uh, Calvin and Luther, I believe, I forgot which one it was, but they despised the black Jews because they wouldn't convert to what they deemed as um, the word of righteousness. And they wanted them put to death. Uh, when I get back to my library, I'm going to go over that again. But if y'all know where it is, you can put it in the comment board. So that people can see the video I discussed. It was either John Calvin or Martin Luther. I forgot which one of them wanted the black Jews put to death. Okay. Um, again, so back to these church fathers. Um, you got even to show you how crafty they are. With the Israelites on the rise, the urban apologists, I'll put some, I'll put some respect on your name. The urban apologists found some Africans that supported white folks or white supremacy. And they will reference African apologists. No, see, this one is black and that one is black too. There's all, listen, to this, there's always been coons amongst us. Judas Iscariot, coon, the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees, coons, the Herodians, coons. You have always had black, people, Israelites, who have sold their race out, okay? So now, what I want to do now, I want to show you a video dictionary. I want to show a dictionary about preaching because these um, apologists, they have a, a thing against preaching in the streets, and this is why they're getting aware. Eric, Dr. Eric Mason, that's why I said earlier, <clears throat> When things go down in the black community, where is Dr. Eric Mason? Hiding behind a keyboard. He's not in the forefront. He's not organizing the people. He's not telling them the truth about what it is, why black people are getting shot down. He's not explaining nothing. Him or the sister that's with him, none of them. But the Israelites are in the street. Okay, whether you like it or not. So let's take a look at what the so-called scholars said about biblical street preaching. Let's take a look at this video real quick. I'll be right back again. A biblical and theological dictionary. Explanatory of the history, manners, and customs of the Jews and neighboring nations with an account of the most remarkable places and persons mentioned in sacred scripture. All right, let's go down. When was this published? 1857, 1857, now we're going to go inside the book and we're going to look up the word preaching. Here's the word preaching, is the discoursing publicly of any religious subject. Let's go down to the highlighted areas. It reads, y'all read along with me. Some of them opened schools or houses of instruction. Let me study it a little bit. Hold on, hold on. Some of them opened schools or houses of instruction. And there too, their disciples, they taught the pure religion of Moses. At Naioth, in the suburbs of Ramah, there was one where Samuel dwelt. And there was one at Jericho and a third at Bethel, to which Elijah and Elisha often resorted. Then the people went on Sabbath days and at new moons and received a public lesson 
and receive public lessons of piety and morality. Okay, that's 1 Samuel uh, 19, 18, 2 Kings 2, verse 2 and 5, chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. Through all of this period, however, there was a dismal confusion of the useful ordinance of public preaching. Let's go down. And at other seasons again, itinerants, both princes, priests, and Levites, were sent through all the country to carry the book of the law and to teach in the cities. See that? Let's go down. Watch this. Many of the discourses were preached in camps. You see that part, camps? A lot of you black Christians despise camps. Even you got some Israelites that despise camps. Showing you they don't know history. They don't know the Bible. They don't know nothing. Let's read it again. Many of the discourses were preached in camps and courts, in streets, schools, cities, villages, sometimes with great composure and coolness. At other times with vehement action and rapturous energy, sometimes in a plain blunt style, at other times in all the magnificent pomp of Eastern allegory. See, the teachers all had different methods, different tones. See that? None of them were wrong. Let's read on. Where am I at? On some occasions, the preachers appeared in public with visible signs. Just like in Ezekiel 37, it tells us to take out the sign with the 12 tribes on it. Y'all get mad at that? On some occasions, the preachers appeared in public with visible signs, with implements of war, with yokes of slavery, or something adapted to their subject. They gave lectures on these, held them up to view, girded them on, broke them in pieces, rent their garments, rolled in the dust, and endeavored by all the, all the what? Mm, bear with me. All the methods they could devise agreeably to the customs of their country to impress the minds of their auditors with the nature and importance of their doctrines. Wow. Now watch this part here. Very important, very important, very important. This is after the death of the apostles. The apostles being dead, everything came to pass as they had foretold. The whole Christian system in time underwent a miserable change. Preaching shared the fate of other institutions and the glory of the primitive church gradually degenerated. Those writers whom we call the fathers, however, held up to view by some as models for imitation. Do not, let's read that again, do not deserve that indiscriminate praise ascribed to them. Like we hear these apologetics always talk about the church fathers and they're talking about white folks. They're not talking about the fathers of the Bible. They're talking about white folks who supported white supremacy. Okay, let's read, I'm at the word Christianity. Christianity, it is true, is found in their writings but how sadly incorporated with, with pagan philosophy and Jewish allegory. So Christianity is filled with pagan philosophy and Jewish allegory. Lies. All right, so we're back. So now, real quick, I, I said earlier how these apologists, whether Edomite apologists or urban apologists, they always reference what they call church fathers. But their church fathers that they reference and adore are not the true fathers of the Bible. Like, like in the dictionary, it said these people that they reference as church fathers, they have put a stain on the biblical truth with bringing in paganism and Jewish allegory. So let's get to the truth. Who are the fathers? Deuteronomy 29. Let's start there. Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 13. And it reads that he may establish thee today for a people unto himself, speaking to the Israelites, and that he may be unto thee a God as he had said unto thee, 
and as he hath sworn unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. See, these are the fathers. Let's go to the book of Micah real quick. Micah, Micah chapter 7 and verse 20. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. See that? Let's go to the book of Malachi. Come on. Malachi chapter 4. Verse 5 and 6. I'm discussing the true fathers. Uh, let's start at verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Watch. Verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the righteous descendants. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. We're the children. Okay. And the heart of the children, meaning our minds, because we're the children, to their fathers. So our fathers are Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and a righteous remnant that came from them, like Isaiah, Malachi, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Christ, Peter, James, John, Paul, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. These are the true fathers. Okay, let's read that again. Verse five. I mean, verse six, verse six, excuse me. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. See, this is why, we, this is the great awakening. Our people are waking up left, right, east, west, north, south. We are waking up. We are waking up. Like, like Dr. Eric Mason said, this is the fastest growing movement ever. And you ain't stopping it. I'm just waiting for our brothers in the nation of Islam to repent of their sins and come join us. That's what I'm waiting on. Now, whether it's going to come to pass, only the Lord knows. Only the Lord knows. Now, from there, let's go to the book of Romans. The book of Romans, chapter 9. Watch this. Let's read verse 4 and 5. It reads, Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth? The word pertaineth means belong to. Belong to, excuse me. Let's read that again. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth? The word pertaineth means belongs to. To whom pertaineth the adoption? So the adoption is Christ dying on the cross. That only pertains to the Israelites. And the glory. The glory is the kingdom of heaven and, and righteous rulership. That only pertains to the Israelites. And the covenants. See that? The old and new covenant only pertains to the Israelites and the giving of the law. See, the giving of the law only pertains to the Israelites and the service of God. The servants of God only are the Israelites. Then it says, and the promises. The promises only pertain to the Israelites. Whose are the fathers? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Whose are the fathers? Who are uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the father of? All people on the planet Earth? No. No. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are the fathers of the Israelites. From them, you got the 12 patriarch, patriarchs, excuse me, <laughs> Judah, Benjamin, Levi, Ephraim, Manasseh, Gad, Reuben, uh, Simeon, uh, uh, Issachar, Naphtali, so forth, Zebulon. Out of them came the 12 tribes of Israel. Out of them, you got all the rest of our fathers, okay? All the rest of our mighty and great fathers. Like, 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 like who? Like Moses, Joshua, Samuel, okay? Uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, Job. Uh, who else? You got Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Ezekiel, 
Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Okay, then you got people like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, James, John. Okay, Timothy, so forth and so on. The list goes on and on to the break of dawn. I'm telling you, I'm, those are the fathers. So don't be running. The, John Calvin is the father. John Calvin ain't SH. He's an Edomite, by the way. Martin Luther's the father. Martin Luther ain't SH. Well, what about Turtle? That Turtle ain't nothing. The hell is this? What the hell is wrong with you? You give credit to anybody but the fathers of the Bible. Let's go on back. Romans chapter 9, verse 5. Whose are the fathers? Who are the fathers of the Israelites? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came. See, Christ came concerning the flesh to the Israelites, not to spiritual Israel. It's, let's read that part again. Uh, whose are the fathers? And of whom, as concerning the flesh. Touch us. Touch. Since you don't, if you don't know what the flesh is, hold your hand out. Hold out your hand on the black hand side. <laughs> Grab the skin. That's the flesh. That's the flesh. Let's read that again. Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came? Who is over all? God bless forever. Amen. All praises. Now, the young lady in the video I don't even know her name, said while in cemetery school, you know, y'all know that's what I call it. They call it seminary. I call it cemetery because you come out of there the walking dead. Uh, she said when she was in cemetery school, her friend was dating someone. Let me tell y'all about Christianity. I always say it's a, a filthy religion. In the Bible, and I challenge anybody, there's no such thing as dating in the Bible. Now, you men and women know that's listening right now. When we dated back in the world, back in the world, back in the world, what did dating equal? Sex, whether kissing, tongue kissing, fingering, or going to first base, second base, third base, all the way home. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Ain't nobody, ain't anybody got time to play with you. And you lying black Christians, you know what I'm saying is true. Dating. You in cemetery school and your, your friend was dating. Like that was okay with the Lord. L l he, watch this, Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers, whoremongers go equals to dating. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. That's why you get judged with herpes, syphilis, gonorrhea, crabs, Genital warts, HIV, that's how you get judged because you hate the law of marriage, okay, which is the seventh commandment when it says thou shalt not commit adultery. That's the law of marriage right there out of the 10. For those of you, that, you only got to keep the 10, you simple selves, simple Simon. That's the law of marriage. Don't break the law of marriage. So when you date, you are breaking the law of marriage. Because guess what? When you fingering and tongue kissing and all of that and it don't work out, what do you do? You, you leave that person and go to the next person. You have broken the law of marriage. And I'm, they don't teach you that in cemetery school? Huh. You black women, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'm saying you black women because the sister running, that was running her mouth with Dr. Eric Mason is a black woman. So yeah, I'm getting on you. Okay? So... She talked about her, her friend's boyfriend, uh, pastor, could not answer question. Her girlfriend, boyfriend's pastor, could not answer questions. And Dr. Eric Mason tried to make mockery of a brother teaching with, as he calls, straw man energy. Let me tell you all something. If the Israelites have straw man energy and we're taking down the Christian church, Brick by brick. What does that say about their doctrine? It has nothing to stand. It's, it's less than straw. 
if we got straw man energy. <laughs> so what does that say about the Christian church teachings? Okay. Also, the sister that was doing the interview talked about two emotional brothers that drove from South Carolina, South Carolina to her HBCU, which I assume was in Louisiana. One was more problematic than the other, but got mad, mad emotional and ran out. And the other one cried and asked, asked the question, tell me why people like me are getting gunned down in the streets. You know, neither her or Dr. Eric Mason answered that question yet from that time that they did that video to this moment right now. And you Christians can't answer that question to this day. Because if they answer with scripture, listen good to what I'm about to say, it's going to be profound. If they dare to answer with scriptural text, they have to acknowledge we are the Israelites. Because no matter what scripture they pull, these scriptures was directed to the children of Israel. So once you open that Bible and give a biblical answer, of why we are being killed in the street or why this is happening, why there's adultery, why there's abortion, you must acknowledge that the people who went into slavery are the children of Israel. Okay, that's that's the danger to them. That's it. I don't answer with that Bible. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. And more than likely, they can't answer. Okay, so. Let me give you an example. Here's an example. And let me help. While I give this example of why we get gunned down in the street, I'm also going to show you scripturally that we're the children of Israel. Watch this. Why do black people get gunned down in the street? Men and women like uh, Philando Castile, Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice. Okay. Uh, the list goes on and on. And there's a list of all hundreds, okay? Watch this. Leviticus 26. Y'all know this. Some of y'all know it. Leviticus 26. This is what Moses said to the children of Israel. Verse 17. And, and he was speaking on behalf of the Lord. And the Lord told Moses to tell us, and I will set my face against you. And ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you. And ye shall flee when none pursueth. You see that? See that part there that says ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you. This is why we get gunned down in the streets. For no apparent reason. There was an incident where a brother was taking care of a disabled brother. They laid on the ground. They put their hands behind their heads, sat down on the ground, laid on the ground, and still got shot. That major outrage this morning after a behavioral therapist was shot by an officer after he held his hands in the air, lying on the ground, his patient with autism sitting right nearby. ABC's Gio Benitez has more on this story. Good morning to you, Gio. Amy, good morning to you. That new video taking social media by storm overnight. The unarmed black behavioral therapist shot by police on the streets of Miami. And police say it all started when they got a call about a man threatening suicide. Watch, just moments before the shooting, you can see 47-year-old Charles Kinsey, his hands raised in the air. The video released overnight by his lawyer. Kinsey in the yellow shirt works at an assisted living facility. And the man at his feet is a 23-year-old with autism who ran away from the group home. Listen as Kinsey talks to police. Kinsey even tries to calm the young man with autism. Amado, please be still, Amado. Down, Amado. Lay on your stomach, Amado. At some point, one of the officers shoots Kinsey, but he survives and speaks with Fox Station WSVN from his hospital bed, recounting what he told that officer. And I'm telling him again, sir, it's no need for a firearm. I'm unarmed. He's an autistic guy. He had a toy truck in his hand. When he hit me, I'm like, I still got my hands in there. I said, no, I just got shot. And I'm standing there, I'm like, sir, why did you shoot me? And his, ex and his words to me, he said, I don't know. Video of the actual shooting hasn't been released, but this is the moment right after. 
And this morning, Kinsey is expected to make a full recovery. The North Miami Police Department has placed the officer on administrative leave, and the local state attorney's office is now investigating Amy. Geo, this is so hard for people to get their heads around after all that has happened. Have the police there admitted that now they know this was a therapist and his patient? Where does this investigation go? Yeah, absolutely. They acknowledge he's an <coughs> ALF employee. They acknowledge the other one is a young man with autism. And that's why, Amy, this is going to be a very serious investigation. A lot of people asking, how could this happen? A lot of people, Geo. All right, thank you. There's a clip of a young man walking past the police. White police got shot up, bang, 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 killed. And the Edomite cop said, oh, he had a gun, and he didn't have a gun. It's an holding citizen, 4,100 killed there by the United Rental, a male who we caught breaking into trucks and stealing radios. He's holding them. This guy's uh, been walking away from the knife in his hand. Right, anybody have a taser? How about 401 Keeler for 815 Robert? Looking for a taser. Arm Defender. Popped our tire on the car, squad. Temper. Anybody close? 401. They're more by car. 45 Robert. We're about two blocks away. The list goes on and on. Trayvon Martin, okay. I remember uh, Michael, uh, what was his name? Michael Brown, I believe it is. Y'all correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it was in St. Louis. Uh, he got gunned down in the street. And his mother and father were so furious, they said, burn this place down. 
Of all the intense reactions that ruled Ferguson Monday night. I'm angry. These people work very hard for this business right here. None were stronger than those of Michael Brown's parents as they learned the grand jury would not indict Officer Darren Wilson. The New York Times posted a video that showed the raw emotion the moment they heard the news. <laughs> what caught many people's attention in that video were the words of Michael Brown's stepfather that could be seen as a call to violence to protesters. <laughs> As the clip gained traction on the web, some noted the words were in direct contradiction to Michael Brown Sr.'s PSA released earlier in the week. Hurting others or destroying property is not the answer. No matter what the grand jury decides, I do not want my son's death to be in vain. On Tuesday, the Brown family attorney addressed the video and criticized those who would hold it against them. It's raw emotion, not appropriate at all, completely inappropriate, and you know, God forbid your child is killed the way they kill, and then they get that just devastating announcement in the manner it was announced, and somebody put a camera on your face, what would be your immediate reaction? So don't condemn them for being, don't condemn them for being human. Y'all correct me if I got the wrong uh, name, but people, the police, and I used to always wonder this. I used to always ask the question, how come when parents children get killed by the police when they come out they say things like uh what's that brother's name can't we all get along uh the one that got beat up by the california cops los angeles police department thanks for joining us for the city of los angeles a third day of tension and violence as night approaches police and national guard units are out in force federal troops are on standby Violence in the city appeared to die down a bit today, but the toll is obvious. 37 people dead, more than 1,300 injured, more than 4,000 arrested. Damage estimate, $200 million and rising. 4,000 National Guard troops have joined the contingent of police and California Highway Patrol officers on the streets. More are on the way. A few hours ago, the man who's become the unwilling symbol of this outbreak of violence decided it was time to speak out. Rodney King appealed for peace. I just want to say, you know, can we can we all get along? Can we can we get along? Um, can we stop making it making it horrible for for the for the older people and the, and, the, and the and the kids? Why can't we all get along? Let's have peace. Give love a chance. They say things like that. But Michael Brown's parents, okay said, burn this place down. And the police and the district attorney took them in the back and threatened them and said, if anything happens in this city, not only will you be in prison, you're going to be held to task for whatever happens. And that let me know that that's the reason parents or siblings or loved ones come out and speak kindly before the mob of our people who are angry because of what occurred. They are threatened in the back. Threatened. Okay. Uh, from there, let's go to uh, Zechariah. I'm still dealing with the question. Zechariah, y'all bear with me, bear with me. Chapter 11. And verse five, watch this. I'll start at four. Thus saith the Lord my God, feed the flock of the slaughter. We are the flock of the slaughter. Verse five, whose possessors, and in case you don't know, black man, black woman, we are the possession of the so-called white man and white woman. Verse five again, whose possessors slay them. They kill us, they shoot us in the street and hold themselves not guilty. If there's 10 shootings, nine out of 10 resolve in not guilty on the side of Caucasians, not guilty. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Whose possessors slay them and hold themselves not guilty. And they that sell them, see the white man and white woman that sell us say, blessed be the Lord. Okay. That's what they say in their church. And now watch this. For I am rich. And their own shepherds pity them not. 
What does that part mean? And their own shepherds pity them not. Meaning the reverends and pastors that are over the black communities, the congressmen, congresswomen, senators, they're the shepherds. They don't pity us. They don't pity us. Dr. Eric Mason, that's why I said when things go down, he ain't there. Their own shepherds pity them not. These rev black reverends, ministers, uh, bishops, deacons, they go to their cemetery schools and come out twice dead. They went in dead, come out uh, dead again, twice dead, like it says in the book of Jude. Dead all over again, the walking dead. Let's go to the book of Luke. New Testament, Luke. Testament. Watch this. Luke chapter 1. This precepts with Luke, I mean Leviticus 26, 17. Luke chapter 1 and verse 70 to 74. Watch this. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. How did God speak by the holy prophets? Verse 71. He's going to explain it. That we we Israelites should be saved from our enemies. See, Dr. Eric Mason, who went to cemetery school and a sister that interviewed him, they went to cemetery school. They don't understand the purpose of the Lord is to save us from our enemies. Okay. And from the hand of all that hate us. That includes all the nations. Because you got our people as Saudi Arabia, uh, Libya being sold as slaves. How come Dr. Eric Mason don't talk about that? Doctor? Huh? Huh? Nobody want to talk about that. Our people as, as slaves in Afghanistan, in Yemen, Saudi Arabia, nobody want to talk about that, do they? Not one of you black pastors with your ashy black lips. Get on, get on my daggone nerves. Verse 72, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers. Who's our fathers? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the prophets. And to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. That's what the Lord's program is to save us from our enemies so that we can serve him without fear. Let's get some more. I should have read that one last, but I didn't. But anyway, here's another one why we get shot down and killed in the streets. Okay, uh, let me find it. Lamentations chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. And it reads, As for us, our eyes as yet failed for our vain help. Our vain help is the white man. We always look to the white man for answers. We look to our oppressor for answers and help. It reads on, in our watching, we have watched for a nation that could not save us. See, you thinking the white man has the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ? No, 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 he can't save us. These white people can't save us. That's what I mean. They gave us a false, they, they gave us their false image. And with that false image of the white Jesus, they gave us, gave us a false gospel. That's right. They gave us a false gospel. Let's read that again. As for us, our eyes have yet failed for our vain help. In our watching, we have watched for a nation that could not save us. Watch this. They hunt our steps. The same people that we want help from, they're the ones that hunt our steps. That we cannot go in our streets. Because when we go in our streets, what happened? Bang, bang. I'm dead. Gun me down. They shut us, shoot us down. They hunt our steps that we cannot go in our streets. Our end is near. Our days are fulfilled for our end is come. Our persecutors are swifter than the eagles of the heaven. So our persecutor's symbol would be the eagle. Pull out a dollar bill, please, in case you're stupid. What's the symbol of the United States of America? The eagle. The eagle. In case you don't know who the Bible's talking about. Verse 19 again. Our persecutors are swifter than the eagles of the heaven. They pursued us upon the mountains. They laid wait for us in the wilderness. Just like they were taking over this land. 
They hunted the tribe of Gad, Reuben, Issachar, Ephraim on the mountains. That's what they did. They even got slaves, the Buffalo soldiers, to help them and promised them freedom if they helped, if we helped them slaughter Gad, Reuben, Issachar. And what happened after we helped our people help uh, overthrow them? Right back in slavery. Bye, niggas. Bye. Simple as hell we are. So, I made a statement about um, cemetery schools. I made a joke about them going to seminary schools, which is nothing but cemetery schools. When you look at the book of John, chapter 7. John, chapter 7 and verse 15 it is. It reads, and the Jews... And the Jews marveled, saying, how know of this man letters, having never learned? Meaning, how does he know the letters of Isaiah, Hosea, Malachi, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Moses? How know of this man letters, having never learned? Meaning what? What does that part mean? What does it allude to? They had schools of learning set up where they learned about the writings of the prophets. Christ didn't go to those schools. Those schools were corrupt by this time. Those schools, were, you can read in the book of Kings, where it talks about the sons of the prophets when they spoke to Elisha and Elijah, the sons of the prophets. Those were schools of learning from, from then all the way up. Okay, but what happened? Greece corrupted them. Rome corrupted those schools. That's why when Christ came, he didn't go to those schools. Okay, Acts 4.13. Watch this. Acts 4.13. It reads, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. What does it mean they were unlearned and ignorant men? The way they spoke wasn't as eloquent as those that went to their schools of learning were. They said, nah, mm -mm. Peter and John, they're unlearned. They're ignorant. I could tell by the way they talk. But then it goes on and says, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. What does that mean? Although Peter and John didn't go to those washed out cemetery schools at this time, they knew based on the way they spoke and, how, and what they spoke on, they had walked with Christ. They said, these two guys sound just like that man Christ that we put to death they sound just like him this is why we tell you brothers okay stay out of those cemetery schools learn from the true men of the Lord learn 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 okay and this is why they all wonder they say you you can't you can't refute nothing that the Israelites are saying why because the spirit of God is on us the spirit of the most high God is on us. You ain't refu refuting nothing we say. You could try to make us look bad in the media, accuse us wrongfully. You're going to have to lie on us. That's what you're going to have to do. You could talk circles. And notice these people love these Christians, love to talk, talk. No scripture. Talk, 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 talk. Okay? That's what they do. Now, at the end, Dr. Mason, he made a joke about keeping Israelites on topic. Don't go to that passage. Let's stay in this passage. Now, by him saying that right there reveals to me that he don't know the Bible at all because God teaches us how to read the Bible in the book of Isaiah. Watch this. And Christians hate this. They hate this. Why? Because the white man teaches them to read the book like a, the Bible like a novel. Don't read it the way God says to read it. Read it like a novel. Now, reading it like a novel, it's okay to read it from cover to cover. In fact, we do tell brothers and sisters, read your four chapters a day. Get through the whole Bible so that you can know what its context is all about. But now when you want to understand the mysteries of the Bible, hmm? when you want to understand the mysteries, go to Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Meaning, whom shall the Lord teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk 
and drawn from the breast. So what is the milk? He's comparing the Bible to a baby sucking his mother's breast. We got to be in this Bible sucking both breasts, the old covenant and the new covenant, old Testament, new Testament. We got to be like babies sucking the milk from it. The milk means learn the whole thing, read it, learn them laws, the commandments. That's how it starts off. Okay. Learn the history, the testimony, learn the basics. That's what he's saying, but it goes on. Verse 10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. What does that mean? What does that mean? I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. When you read in Exodus 20 about remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, for in six days the Lord created heaven and earth. No, six days you shall work. Seventh day, I'm best paraphrasing. I'm not looking at it. Seventh day, rest, right? And it ends there. But then you'll read on in uh, further on in Leviticus 16. Okay. Or Ezekiel, let me, uh, Exodus 35, where it says, don't kindle fire on the Sabbath day. In Exodus uh, 35, verse 3, kindle no fire on the Sabbath day. That's another precept. Say, okay. So on the Sabbath, in Exodus 20, it said not to work. Exodus 35 says not to kindle a fire on the Sabbath day. In what context? In Exodus 16, excuse me, in Exodus 16, 23 down, it tells you uh, about not boiling or cooking on the Sabbath day. Okay. And in, uh, let me see, let me look, in Nehemiah 13, it tells you that the Sabbath, be, it says, uh, and it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gate should be shut. It tells you when the Sabbath begins, when it gets dark, which is Friday night. Okay. So that's just giving you an example there on precept upon precept. Okay. Line upon line. Like you read about uh, Psalms 137 about Babylon. The last few verses tells you that Edom is the daughter of Babylon. All right, if Edom, which are the Caucasians, are the daughter of Babylon, when you get to Revelation chapters uh, 18, chapter 17, chapter 14, it talks about Babylon the Great, the daughter of Babylon. That's Esau, Edom. That's just giving you that. See, these Christians ain't learned that yet. These Christians haven't learned that yet at all. Okay, so. Let me see, where, what am I talking about? Okay, so, Acts 5. So now, they make mockery about precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Listen, you Christians don't run nothing. And this is why I tell all the men in Israel not in Christ, when you're teaching, you are in control. Don't let these Christians come up and tell you, no, no, stay in this pasture. Don't, they're not in control. You're out there to help them save their soul. If they don't want their soul, say, let them keep on walking. Kick rocks and go, Dr. Eric Mason. Any little friend doing a little interview, or whatever her name is. When you go to Acts chapter 5 and verse 2, and see, here's the thing that they all got to answer. Acts 5, 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. If God said precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little, meaning here a little in one chapter of, of a book, there a little in another chapter of a book, here a little in the Old Testament, there a little in the New Testament. God says read it like that. Now, should we obey Dr. Eric Mason and don't obey God? See, this is why nobody listens to you Christians. You're a bunch of evil, black, ashy people. You hate the word of God. What you're looking at is Antichrist. What you're looking at is the image of the beast. What you're looking at is 666. The white man, remember, has established his satanic religion, white supremacy, whether he calls it Roman Catholicism or he calls it Protestantism. It's the same evil filth. And what the white man does is hires black people, taskmasters, to watch us and observe us to try and keep us in line, like you're seeing here on the screen. You'll see this black minister giving out food to the slaves. This is the black minister. 
And he's not being, he's not on his own. The white man is observing him to make sure he keeps the slaves in line. Okay. So I often tell y'all this tribulation is coming. We're at the brink of it. We're in the beginning stages of it. Rumors of war. Okay. The pandemic, this is just the beginning. It's going to escalate. Once these blacks fail uh, to keep the Israelites in line with their false narratives, the white man's going to come against us and slaughter and kill and imprison many Israelites. It's biblical. You can read about that in 2nd Ezra 16, Matthew 24. Look, 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 take a look at the black woman. She always got to be the loudest. Look at the white man observing the slaves, making sure they stay in order. This is what's happening in a society today. It happened during the time of Christ. Just take a look at the loud black woman. She's often loud, obnoxious, don't want a man, can't keep a man. Um, got to be out in front. Okay, got so much to say. Always overweight, generally. Uh, hates God's laws. Like when you read De Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, women shall not wear what men wear. She don't give a damn about that. She's going to dress like a man, act like a man, and try to be soft-spoken. She attempts to be soft-spoken, but generally she is not. And if there's a man, black man with her, he's just on the side. He's docile. He's somewhat effeminate. And so anyway, I said all that to say this. They hired black people to come against the truth that the Israelites are teaching. And it's going to fail. Look at the white man observing. He's going to fail miserably. Okay. And he's going to come against us. Expect it. All right. So take a look, take a listen. I lie not. These black people are on a mission. The black woman is on a mission to try to destroy the truth that our people are the Israelites and must keep the commandments. And I'm getting on a black woman because she's often in front. But it's also the black man, too, behind the scenes with his docile self. <laughs> so, brothers, sisters, take a look, take a listen for yourself. I'm Lisa Fields. I'm Christopher Lamarck. And I'm Don Carey. We're the creators of The Unspoken Documentary, which is a film that traces the Christian heritage of Africa to dispel the notion of Christianity being a white man's religion. Yes, and this is a vital, vital topic for our day. Many of us have been walking around meeting people, knowing people who walked away from the church, and they always have this question, is Christianity a white man's religion? I know you probably heard it from your kids that walked away from the faith, your family members, your friends, and you've probably yourself been wrestling with it at times when you see the state of culture today. Well, we wanted to create a resource that will help you to be able to answer these objections in a way that people are getting information today. So research shows that 75% of men would rather watch a story on a movie as opposed to reading it in a book. And so why the documentary? Well, we want to get this information out there in a way that's engaging, powerful, and immersive. Yeah, I remember when we were at a G3 Project HBC tour stop at uh, Bethune-Cookman University, a young man came to the mic with tears in his eyes and said his friends had been challenging him on this notion that Christianity is the white man's religion, and their objections were compelling to him, and he didn't have the information to refute what they were saying, and he was about to walk away from the faith. And he said to us, I came here tonight because this was my last resort. If I don't get the answers I need, I'm going to walk away from the faith. We've been working on this project for over four years, and we're excited that it has been filmed, edited, and ready to go. It's coming to you very soon, but we don't want to just do this alone. We want to do it alongside of you. We want to give you the opportunity to join us in this unprecedented effort to tell the story of Christianity from Africa to America that is going to impact millions of lives across the world. The Israelites have been teaching you that the true teachings of Christ, keeping the commandments, and that Christ is our black Messiah, has been in Africa for a long time. You can read about that in Acts chapter 2, verse 10, where it mentions uh, how the gospel was taught in Egypt, Libya, and Cyrene, which is North Africa, and Acts 8, verse 27, where the gospel was taught to the Ethiopian uh, brother. Okay, so it's nothing new, but what these people, these black Christians want you to think is that white supremacy of a Caucasian Jesus teaching not to keep God's laws have been 
in Africa. No, not from the beginning. No, 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 no. That thing came when Rome destroyed everything. Then the lies came. And that's what these black Christians are pushing. These black Christians are pushing white supremacy and they're trying to disguise it. Brothers and sisters, be warned, be aware, and don't be deceived by them at all. So now let's get to the reading of the shout out letters and donations of support. All right. All right, let's get to the reading of the shout outs. All right, this one is from P. Powell. Hey, Bishop Nathaniel, God bless you, brother. I am greatly inspired by your shout out Tuesday, especially when you bring out the word of God and the history. This world would be finished with uh, without Jesus Christ mercy and righteous teachers like yourself. God bless you and IUIC congregation. Thank you, P. Powell. All praises. All right. The next one is a letter that reads, Shalom Bishop, Most High in Christ, bless you. I pray this letter reach you and your household in perfect peace and in health. Lord's well, getting there. I pray that you continue to get stronger in health so you can continue to be about our Father's business. Lord's will. I listened to you on Shout Out Tuesday. I hear the difference in your voice. All praises. You are sounding much, much better than before. Your voice is much stronger. I give glory to God because I know it won't be long before you will be back and in full effect again. <laughs> Lord's will. Stronger and much wiser than before. What the devil meant for evil, God turned it around for your good. So all praises. Uh, as we'll continue to pray for your strength in the Lord, here is our donation, blankety blank. Uh, we love you, Bishop, Jacob and Johanna, a.k.a. Uh, Terry and Doris B. All praises. Thank y'all so, so much. All praises. All right. The next one is a card. On the front it reads, just want to thank you. Oh, uh, that's that song. Y'all remember that song back in the day in the 90s? I want to thank you, Heavenly Father. Y'all remember that? For shining your light on me. I can't sing, but y'all know the song. <laughs> I forgot the sister that sang the song. But anyway, this card is from Sister Paulette. Uh, Tobit 4, 7 through 9. Uh, blankety blank. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Shalom, most high in Christ. Bless Bishop. All praises. Miss you. I am praying for you and your family. Always love you much. Also for the bishops, deacons, captains, and officers. And the soldiers, my family, the, from the four corners of the world. All praises, all praises. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Heavenly Father. Y'all don't remember that song? For shining your light on me. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good song back in the day. Anyway, this one reads, uh, this is a card. It says, we're so grateful. And this one has little... Very creative card here. All right, let's see what this one says. Uh, to the leadership of IUIC, we all just want to thank you for everything you do and take the time to let you know how much we think of you. Shalom. All right, here is Shalom, love. What is his name? Akisha? E L Keisha. From it's IUIC New York. It says Elkisha and family, but then I don't know if I'm pronouncing Elkisha right. Or is it Ikisha or E Kisha? You know who you are. Thank you, sis. All praises to the Lord. Thank you, thank you. All praises. All right. The next one is a card that says "Thinking of you." Ah, uh, Shalom, glory to the Most High. I continue in my search for my Hebrew. Ah, uh, does that say roots? Yes, I believe that says roots, and IUIC is guiding me to the light. Look forward to watching you on YouTube. Help uh, keep teaching, keep reading the lost tribes. Peace, Sister Linda. Thank you, Sister Linda. All praises. All right, this letter is from Brother C. C and Y, K. 
Kerr. Soon to be Brother Adar. All right. I see you got your number there. I'll have Deacon Asaph definitely reach out to you. Uh, it reads, Shalom, Bishop Nathaniel. Most High in Christ, blessed to you and your family. Glad to hear that you are regaining your strength from the sound of your voice. I thank the Most High God daily for all the prophets and brethren of IUIC. I've been in the truth now since March 2020. All praises. Right about, no, right around the start of the pandemic, when the Most High began to quiet the noise across the globe, and we were all forced to stay indoors and occupy our minds differently. Right. What Esau meant for evil, the Lord meant for good. Because you know now, they got an Omicron. There was a, something with a D, the relevant, I can't remember the word, but this is like the third version of this thing now. So everybody, let's eat right. Let's eat our ginger. Let's drink our ginger. Make them drinks. You know, you got your laba. What is it called? Baba Koo drink that Deacon Malachi made. You got the drink that Deacon Asaph made. I forgot the name of Deacon Asaph made. I forgot the name of that drink. But very good. You got a lot of nutrients in it. Okay. All right. Let me read this again. I'm sorry. I've been in truth now since March 2020, right around the start of the pandemic, when the Most High began to quiet the noise across the globe, and we were all forced to stay indoors and occupy our minds differently. The Most High used my now ex-wife, wow, to introduce me to IUIC's classes online. And I have not looked back since. I have since then stopped eating unclean foods, started growing my beard, and keep the Sabbath day holy. I am making haste to follow all the laws, statutes, and commandments to the best of my ability. All praise to the Most High for putting and keeping his righteous spirit on me. My spiritual journey started about 10 years ago when my girlfriend at the time introduced me to Dr. Wayne Dyer, who explained in his teachings that we humans were actually spirits living in a human experience or existence. That tweaked my interest because until that time, I had never thought of my existence in that way. Fast forward 10 years later, and knowing all that I have learned from IUIC's biblical teachings, it is all very clear to me now. Also, when I look back on all my travels across the globe, having observed and experienced how our people, the Israelites, are mistreated and marginalized globally, and remembering always asking myself the question, why are we so hated? The answer is also very clear to me now simply because we are the chosen people of the book and all the other nations envy our preeminence and our inheritance. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin and I'm an active member of the Booster Club from the day I learned I was Israel. This is my first shout out letter. I am ready to start congregating and putting more work for the Most High, gathering sheep to the flock and saving as many Israelites as possible. There is much work to be done. I believe that the Most High directed me to IUIC to utilize my drive, talents, and exp expertise. I have reached out to Officer Kemuel and Officer Arali in the Florida camps and will begin my lifelong journey with the body soon, God's willing. I'm excited and looking forward to doing God's work, Bishop. Most High in Christ, bless Shalom. All praises, thank you, thank you, Brother Adar. All praises, thank you so, so much. All right, all right. Now, I always say this about um, the three trials of faith. You have your individual trials. You have your family trials, like uh, the brother Chris was just talking about um, his now ex-wife. And then you have your congregational trials. The congregation, remember, the congregation consists of men and women who are struggling to come to the foreknowledge and image of Christ. They, or I'll say we, have or go through many ups and downs, highs and lows. We have likes and dislikes. And when we meet each other, sometimes at one time or another, we may clash. That does not mean to run and head for the hills. Nope, that means the Lord is testing you on how you deal with your neighbor. Because many times we say we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. No, that's easy to do from a distance. But when we get face to face and it comes time to apply, now is test time. So I want all you brothers and especially you sisters, I hear this from women all the time. Oh, she's mean. She said this. She did. Listen, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Apply the scriptures. You must, you must, you must. We cannot just say we love our neighbor as we love ourselves in word, but indeed we don't. 
Okay, so that that the congregational trials that that's a biggie. I see that's a big one right there. All right, let's get to the shout out donations. We want to give a shout out of thanks to D Scully. Thank you, D Scully. D Scully again. D Scully one more again, and D Scully one more again. Shout out of thanks to uh, P Powell. Thank you, P Powell. Shout out of thanks to Terry and Doris B. Thank y'all so much. Shout out to Brother Adar. Brother Adar again. All praises. And Brother Adar again. All praises. Shout out of thanks to Shaylin B. Okay, Shaylin, thank you so much. Shout out. Shout out to Shaylin B again. Thank you so much. And shout out to Cassandra DG of Las Vegas, Nevada. Shout out of thanks to Paulette G. Thank you so much, Paulette. Thank you. Shout out of, to Paulette G again. Thank you so much. And shout out to Elkeisha. That's the name. Elkeisha L. Elkeisha of Patchog, New York. <laughs> shout out of thanks to... Hmm, all right. Is that Linda D. I believe that's Linda. Linda D, thank you so much. All praises, all praises. Shout out of thanks to, all right, where's the name on this? Oh, Dennis L. Dennis L, thank you so, so much. All praises, all praises. Uh, this one, I've seen this before, but again, there's no name on it. I see uh, Memo to the 12 tribes worldwide. I see that. And it says fundraising on it. All praise. Thank you so much. You know who you are. And last but not least, let's give a shout out of thanks to Sam E. of Nanatoke, Pennsylvania. Thank y'all so, so much. You know how I love to say, let's all of us stay healthy. Let's stay faithful. Let's stay faithful. Let's stay focused. <laughs> I almost messed that up. But most of all, let's all of us stay in the spirit. Most high in Christ, bless you all. Love you. Shalom. We used to scream black power while Heron was pushed. But at the end of the day, nothing's in vain. IUIC has been given a vision. The tents of Judah has risen. Many has attempted the mission. Minor murmuring, omitting, and missing the mark. Just reading that he had the flame of fire in his eyes gave us the spark. We on Paul's mission. We out on the road, purple and gold. From Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, Ghana, Sierra Leone. 144,000 boots banging, concrete crackling. These are how our men repented at heart. The scriptures is proof. IUIC, we deliver the truth.